Elon is about to say goodbye to Starbase. Yes, you heard right. While the entire aerospace industry was paying attention to Starship's recent consecutive tests, a major reorganization was quietly underway at SpaceX's Texas launch facility. This is part of the plan to push for the next milestone of the super mega rocket, Starship in 2024. So what actually happened? Who will take over Starbase instead of Elon? Why did Elon Musk select them? Discuss everything about this in today's episode of TechMap. But before we begin, our team extends a warm welcome. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and enable notifications to stay up to date with the latest news from SpaceX and the world of space. With that in mind, let's jump straight into today's episode. Starbase has recently caught the public's eye with a series of hot news, including the Starship test flight plan in 2024, the Ship 28 static fire test, and the static fire attempt of Booster 10. Besides the announcement through SpaceX's official X account, one of these news was also announced by Kathy Lewiters, general manager of Starbase. You may have only recently heard of her as one of SpaceX's official spokespersons at Starbase. And that is extremely reasonable. Previously, Kathy Luters served as NASA Human Spaceflight Chief. After stepping down from NASA in April this year, she has been hired by SpaceX to hold a general manager position in Starbase, and her task is to report directly to SpaceX President and Chief Operating Officer Gwyn Shotwell. So I think you should follow her X account now if you haven't already unless you want to miss out on important information regarding Starship operations, especially within the context that the Boca Chica spaceport is going to be the premier center for this mega rocket. One more hint, Elon Musk seems less active in updating Starship activities. For example, it wasn't until two days after Ship 28's static fire test that we saw his tweet on X on the subject. That may mean that Elon Musk will no longer hold a key role at Starbase. There will be a group of people handling daily tasks for him, such as speaking to the public and responding to the press. The reason for this transfer of power may simply be because Starship's progress is growing too fast. Just one month after Flight 2, SpaceX quickly entered the series of tests for the next Starship's prototype, consisting of Ship 28 and Booster 10, which began with the static fire test of Ship 28. Positive signs from the November test inspired the company to plan more Starship test flights in 2024, so he really needs extra support while he focuses on his other company's projects. To be honest, it's not the first time a significant reorganization has been undergone in SpaceX's Texas. In 2022, there was a notice that SpaceX President and CEO Gwen Shotwell and Vice President Mark Junkosa, two of the most influential executives at the company, would oversee the facility and operations of the company's Starbase location, both of them seemingly stepped in for Elon Musk as the CEO shifted his focus to Twitter, meaning that Elon Musk would step back from some of his day-to-day -day at this spaceport. Twitter by then was in a precarious position after the Tesla CEO and SpaceX founder had purchased the social media platform for an inflated price of $44 billion, saddling it with immense debt. The immediate implementation of far-reaching changes or threats of changes, scared off existing advertisers, slashing the company's already tenuous revenue, and Musk himself admitted that the company as it stood was losing billions of dollars per year and could face bankruptcy if it's planned to charge a subscription for a verification badge, a service that was, in theory, previously free, was not highly successful. However, as you can see, even though he handed over Starship operations to his colleagues, that does not mean that the Starship program will be delayed or that Elon will no longer focus on the Red Planet program. Mars colonization is always the most ambitious mission of his life, so any survival decision requires careful planning in advance. Musk's plan at that time was to appoint Gwen Shotwell to officially assume oversight of the company's Starship program and Starbase facilities. Additionally, SpaceX CEO Mark Junkosa, an engineer who had successfully led the Starlink program since Musk fired several cautious CEOs in 2018, has assumed technical leadership of the Starship program in the summer of 2022. It could be said that this reorganization demonstrates a sense of urgency within the company to get Starship flying. Both Shotwell and Junkosa have been at SpaceX since its early days under Musk. 
For those living under a rock, Starbase's situation at that time was quite at rock bottom. SpaceX was gearing up everything for Starship's first orbital flight, including completing Starbase's infrastructure that required an environmental assessment key to the company receiving a license from the federal regulator for Starship launches. After a long wait, the FAA finally finished this assessment in June 2022, but as a result of that FAA decision, SpaceX was required to take more than 75 environmental mitigation steps. In 2021, Musk described a crisis with Raptor engine production, which caused the removal of a vice president from the program who left the company. Since then, SpaceX ramped up Raptor production to seven engines per week, which is important given that each super heavy booster requires 33 engines and each Starship rocket has six engines. To adapt to the increasing amount of work, Musk pushed for employees at its Hawthorne, California, headquarters to move to Starbase to help with the Starship effort. The company even rolled out an offer to salaried employees for pay bumps between 10% to 25% if they moved to South Texas. The company also increased its hourly pay rates for non-salaried Starbase employees, as well as added performance-based incentives for 2023. So why did Elon choose those faces to be on the Starbase board of directors? Musk is self-made, but he's relied on several trusted advisors or lieutenants to help him build and lead his companies. For SpaceX's Starship program, the most ambitious mission of his life, he had to choose people more carefully. For that reason, the people he chooses must have special potential. First of all, let's talk about the new face, Kathy Luters, who quietly made history at NASA. In her working time at NASA, she served as commercial crew program manager in 2013, and then as full-time manager the following year. Through Luiters' quiet efforts, the first human beings to launch from American soil since the space shuttle's retirement in 2011 traveled to the International Space Station on May 30, 2020, aboard a SpaceX Crew Dragon. Since then, the Crew Dragon has made a number of flights, both for NASA and private customers, proving the commercial crew concept. The great efforts she contributed to both NASA and SpaceX left a huge impression on Elon's mind. The next up is Gwyn Shotwell, well, a much familiar to SpaceX fans. Known as SpaceX's secret weapon, it's entirely possible that SpaceX wouldn't have survived if her sales acumen hadn't convinced NASA to take a billion-dollar bet on the company in 2008. But NASA ultimately took that bet right when SpaceX needed it most, and Shotwell went on to help secure another several billion dollars of launch contracts from all possible sectors. It's possible that her day-to-day -day work mainly focused on SpaceX's Dragon, Falcon, and Starlink programs. But Starship's program would almost not be able to progress, as far as it is today, without being funded by contracts lucrative that Shotwell has achieved in those times. The last person is Mark Juncosa, the company's vice president of vehicle engineering. Actually, there is not much information about this lieutenant of Elon Musk. We only know that he was previously in charge of SpaceX's Starlink Space Internet Initiative and has now taken on that role, overseeing hardware development and the Starship program schedule. According to current employees, Juncosa's takeover of Starship responsibilities coincides with an increased focus on launch reliability and more de-risking testing. The early years of the vehicle's development were riskier, with SpaceX conducting multiple suborbital test flights every few months, some ending in crash landings that scattered pieces burst on nearby wetlands. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification feature so you don't miss any space-important updates. Your support is our driving force to continue delivering high-quality content. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.